Yes, Judge. Sir, would you please tell us your full name and spell your last name for the record? Sergeant Scott Litke, L I E T K E. And how are you presently employed? As a police officer with the City of Akron Police Department. How long have you been employed in total with the Akron Police Department as a police officer? Almost 16 years. And can you kind of take us through your career in regards to the job duties and ranks that you've held? Uh, I did between seven and eight years as a patrol officer after completing the Opata Basic Academy. Uh, I was promoted to sergeant. I did approximately a year uh, on platoon four as a platoon, uh, patrol sergeant. And then I moved to the uh, as supervisor in the Midnight Major Crimes Unit for the last six years. And as a supervisor uh, of the Major Crimes Unit for the last six years, can you tell us uh, your duties and responsibilities within that role? Uh, my unit responds to uh, major crimes that occur between the hours of 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. Uh, this includes homicides, rapes, robberies, any other major crime where a person is injured or involved. Uh, I also have administrative duties of approving reports for uh, sporting detectives, and, um, reviewing their cases, uh, scheduling, things of that sort. As far as uh, detectives who work under you? Is there a group of detectives uh, who work that same shift uh, assisting you in investigating crimes? Yes, I have uh, six detectives that work with me. And in regard to the Akron Police Department, is there another group or platoon that works the daytime shift? Uh, yes, there's actually three shifts. There's uh, the day shift uh, uh, crimes against persons shift. There's also 311 and midnights. And we've heard the uh, Lieutenant Dave Witten's name thrown out. Uh, what, what is his role at the Akron Police Department? Uh, lieutenant Witten is uh, presently the only lieutenant in the uh, persons unit, our major crimes unit with the police department, and is the overall commander. In regard then to your job duties and responsibilities, have you also received any specialized and additional training uh, for your job? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, through the state of Ohio or OPADA, uh, training program, I've uh, obtained a Master of Criminal Investigator Certificate, meaning that I've went to schools on death investigation, blood spatter, uh, um, crime scene analysis, and other, other schools. And in regard to uh, investigating uh, violent crimes, are they limited to homicides? No, we do felonious assaults, which are shootings, stabbings, or anything where a uh, person sustains major injury, uh, um, home invasion robberies, aggravated robbery, aggravated burglary, uh, rapes, uh, all, all manner of violent crime against a person. If I were to estimate how many of these crimes you investigated, um, if you feel more comfortable estimating on a weekly, monthly, yearly basis. Well, um, each of my detectives and I average around 80 cases a year. I've been doing it for six years. Did you say 80? 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80 cases a year. So I'm somewhat involved in their cases and I have my own case load. Uh, as far as homicides go, the city of Akron has usually between 25 and 30 a year. Uh, we get somewhere between 8 and 12 of those on my shift. And I'm uh, involved in each one of those investigations, either as the lead detective or assisting the lead detective as their supervisor. And you've done so for the last six years? That's correct. Uh, now, in this case, uh, it's become fairly obvious that, that a video uh, played a key role in the case. As far as your prior experience, uh, and video analysis and videos uh, become a part of your criminal investigations? Uh, yes, it increases every year um, with the amount of cell phone cameras uh, and businesses with video. Um, video analysis has almost become a routine part of uh, any investigation we do. And as part of your job, uh, what do you generally do when you receive a video that may either show a crime or be related to, to solving a crime? 
Well, the, the video is a tool, um, and we use it to uh, interview the witnesses, um, ask the right questions, and really understand the crime. You also utilize the video to connect it to other pieces of evidence that you may receive during the course of the investigation. That's correct. And do you ever analyze the video yourself as far as using your expertise and your experience in, in investigative crimes to help determine what's going on in, in the video itself? Yes. If I were to ask you to estimate how many times a video has played a role <coughs> in your investigation, which required you to do some sort of analysis, could you give me an estimate? I would say more than 50, up to 100, somewhere in there. <coughs> Sergeant Lickey, did you and the Akron Police Department then become involved in the shooting uh, that occurred at Papa Don's Pub? I did. And uh, where is Papa Don's Pub located? It's lo located at 1891 East Market Street in the city of Akron, Summit County, Ohio. And was that a result of calls to the 911 operator initially? It was. And the 911 operating system, is that, uh, is that part of the Akron Police Department? It is. Um, safety Communications is its own entity, but it's run by the Police Department, and it's continuously staffed by a police sergeant. Uh, who monitors the radio room. And those calls are, are recorded? They are. And in, in regard to a specific event, can the 911 operating system receive more than one call? Uh, yes, that happens frequently. And did that occur in this case? It did. At this time, Your Honor, I'm going to play Exhibit 15 in the 911 calls in the case. Thank you. 
call to see if they get a call and it's a hang up to call back. That's correct. Did that appear what was going on with that call potential? Yes, sir. <coughs> All right, Sergeant, as a result of that call then coming into the Arkansas Police Department, uh, tell us where you were and what initial steps you took in this investigation. Uh, myself and Detective John Ross were uh, out of the office at the time working on a homicide that had occurred the night before. Uh, we were near the intersection of Main and Market Street, so we proceeded down East Market Street to Papa Don's Pub. Uh, uh, we parked... Uh, about a hundred yards east of the crime scene and uh, approached on kind of west of the crime scene and approached on foot. What happened then? Uh, I entered the parking lot and uh, my first contact was, was with Officer Chris Crockett. Uh, he briefed me on what he had to this point. That Officer Weinbrenner uh, was in the back of the, of the ambulance um, and that he had been shot and his condition was critical at that point um, and that there was another male inside with uh, a serious gunshot wound and several other possible victims also inside. So in regards, when you arrive on the scene, Officer Weinbrenner is not down on the parking lot but is, is in the ambulance at that point? Yes, I did not see him. Um, what did you do next? Uh, I entered the bar. Uh, <coughs> I'd never been in the bar, the bar before, uh, um, so uh, I entered the bar and kind of got a look at uh, the scene itself and started to analyze what we're going to have to do to control the scene. Obviously, it's chaotic; people are running any, everywhere, unsure what to do. Um, uh, I asked um, the patrol sergeant at the wrong scene to begin putting up crime scene tape inside the bar to cordon off the area by the booths and uh, a, a slice corner there in the patio area to let them know that I wanted all witnesses in that area and I wanted to clear the rest of the bar of individuals to, to try to protect what was already a crime scene that had been obviously changed by the number of people that were in the bar when the crime occurred. So we've seen some of the photos. Uh, when we're talking about that crime tape, though, would it have been uh, thrown across these tables here or in that area? Correct. And that was specifically to try to have a place where you could keep witnesses on one side and, and preserve where you were of the understanding the, the shooting occurred on the other side. Is that fair to say? I want to protect most of the evidence as, as much as possible. What else did you observe and do inside the, uh, the pump? Uh, I went inside with Officer Crockett into the video room. Uh, we ascertained the way the suspect had fled. Um, uh, another uh, barber bar named Courtney Jewett came in who also knew how to operate the system. I wanted to get a basic idea of what had taken place inside the bar. And that was the first time I viewed a, a brief snippet of the video so that we knew what we were looking for. While speaking with um, Ms. Jewett, I became aware that there was an Ellet football fundraiser that night. Um, and that the parties involved in this had both been at that fundraiser. Now, um, having lived in Ellet myself at one point, um, I'm aware, and being working at the police department, I'm aware of the people from the police department who are involved in that. So um, I had arranged to call Sergeant Malik or Sergeant Forney, who I know coached uh, in the LA Youth Football League, so they may be able to recognize the, the person in the video um, so that we could get a suspect name. And we able to get in contact with either of those officers? Um, I did not do that personally. I know that that um, I requested with uh, Lieutenant Chris Brewer uh, that, that that be done, and, and I know he caused that to happen. And when we're talking about uh, things that are done in the course of the investigation, um, as the supervisor of the major crime unit, are you making the calls to, for the most part and delegating other officers and detectives 
terms as to what duties they should perform there on the scene and, and subsequently? Right. I'm trying to take in all the information and, um, you know, the, the patrol commander has ultimate command of the, the situation, but he also allows me kind of control of this inner perimeter scene so I can set up the investigation the way that I feel it needs to be done. And then the patrol officers outside will keep a perimeter, help me keep witnesses where I need them, and assist me in, in, the, in that way. And jumping ahead of it, uh, Lieutenant Dave Witted, did he then also, because of the nature of this case, become involved in making decisions and, and delegating duties? Um, I needed more detectives. I had to send Detective Stewart, uh, as we've already heard, to the hospital. Uh, to check on the condition of Officer Weinbrenner. Um, I had Detective Steve Marr at, at what we call our DB desk, which is a position that takes in evidence and takes all our phone calls to the Detective Bureau. And I had Detective Ross with me. That was it. There were four detectives working there at night. And uh, that was not, not a sufficient number for um, what we had going on at the time. and ask them to come in and assist me with this uh, uh, crime scene. So going back, you want uh, to make contact with uh, Officer Malik, Officer Forney, because they're coaches on the South Indian football team, and were you successful in making contact with either of those? Uh, Detective Malik did arrive a short time later. Uh, uh, he was able to make uh, give us a name who he believed. He saw the video, he did say um, who, he, who he believed it was, but within minutes that was rendered inconse inconsequential because an apprehension was made and uh, you know the, the names matched. And what was that name? Keenan Ivory. Uh, what happened next in the investigation? Um, Mr. Ivory was transported to the hospital. Um, we divided the crime scene. I set up Detective Ross in a booth uh, at the um, north end of the bar. Um, when Detective Morrow was able to be relieved at the DV desk, I had him take a booth, and then I had Detective Stewart come from the hospital um, once it was determined that Officer Weinbrenner had passed. Uh, I had her come and set up in the third booth and begin interviewing everyone in the bar one at a time, um, getting a, I wouldn't call it a complete interview, but uh, an in the moment uh, interview of what happened and all their contact information. So if need be, we could contact them at a later date. Okay. What happened there? Uh, I called, like I said, I called Lieutenant Whitten and, and, and Detective Morrison. Detective Morrison began helping with the interviews. The crime scene unit arrived. I helped walk them through uh, the area, let, let them know that the evidence that had been located so far in the areas that would be helpful to search for additional evidence. Um, Lieutenant Whitten then arrives on scene. I brief him on the condition of the scene and request that he take command of the overall scene so I can then continue the investigation with witnesses. Once the witnesses are interviewed at the um, at the bar, we now want to move to the hospitals to interview victims that have been injured in this to gather more information. And did you in fact then go to, to the hospital? I did. Um, I went to Akron General Medical Center. Um, I was told that uh, um, the victim at City Hospital, besides Officer Weinbrenner, was Dave McCady, and he was critically injured in surgery and not available for us to talk to at the time. So the only people that we had that were injured uh, um, were Miss, Mr. Capes, Ms. Imhoff, and Keenan Ivory, and they were all at Akron General Medical Center. So me and my detectives proceeded there. What happened then when you arrived at Akron General Medical Center? We completed an interview with uh, Jennifer Imhoff. Uh, we completed an interview with Michael Capes, and uh, Detective Ross and I completed a short interview with uh, Keenan Ivory. And where was Keenan Ivory when you spoke with yeah. him? Uh, he was in uh, a, an emergency room where he would be treated. 
And when you saw him, did you see signs uh, that he was injury, injured or was in need of medical attention? Uh, yes, he had a pretty serious dog bite to his leg. And you, you indicated that it was a brief conversation, is that correct? That's right. Um, detective, I read him his Miranda rights um, and he began to ask him questions. Tell us about that. Um, I asked him uh, if he was at uh, Papa Don's bar and I believe it was and I don't, I don't believe the exact, I don't remember the exact word of the question, but he had agreed to it being in some sort of squabble at the bar. My next question was, what kind of gun did you have? And at that point, he asked for his attorney, and the questioning ceased. Uh, in total, how long did that brief conversation last? Maybe, maybe 30 seconds. Did you have an opportunity to you, to then see Jeff Rittenhoff as well? Is that correct? Um, we did. Pardon? We did. And tell us the uh, extent of what you were able to do uh, with her at that time. Uh, we interviewed her. Um, her interview wasn't extraordinarily helpful. She was um, pretty intoxicated at the time. Ultimately, then, Sergeant, as part of this investigation, did you receive medical records from those who had, in fact, received treatment uh, both at Akron General Medical Center and at City Hospital? I did. you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 147 and ask you if you're able to identify that exhibit. These are the uh, medical records from Akron General Medical Center uh, as regarded to the treatment of Keenan Ivory on 11-16 through 11-17 of 2014. Handing you now State's Exhibit 148, ask you to identify that exhibit. These are the medical records of Michael Capes um, the, from Akron General Medical Center to cover his uh, treatment on 11-16 of 2014. And State's Exhibit 149. These are the medical records of Jennifer Imhoff uh, from the Akron General Medical Center regarding her treatment on 11-16 of 2014. And then previously marked uh, was Defendant's Exhibit A, which I'll show you. These are the um, medical records from Summa Health Systems, or Akron City Hospital, uh, for David Wokady. They cover his care from 11-16 of 2014 to 11-22 of 2014. for uh, the last probably 10 years before that it was 0.10 um, but that's um, different from blood serum which is 0.96 so when you do it at the hospital it's typically blood serum that you do rather than um, you know a breathalyzer what a breathalyzer would show. So the law differentiates between the type of substance that's being tested via the breath 
a lot of urine or blood serum, is that correct? Correct. And so when we say 0.08, we're talking about blood serum. What is the legal limit in regards to driving? 0.96. 0.96. So that's a little bit higher than the 0.08 for blood. Correct. Uh, and through these medical records, um, were you able to view the blood serum levels of these individuals? Yes. And first of all, in regards to um, Keenan Ivory, uh, when his blood serum was tested, what were the results? Uh, 105. So at least as to driving, that would be over the legal limit, correct? That is correct. Is there anything else in the system? Um, the report also indicates the presence of THC. And are you familiar with THC? Is to, uh, what kind of drug uh, produces THC in a person's system? Uh, for lack of a better term, it's the active ingredient in marijuana. In regards to Dave O'Kady, do you recall what his blood serum level was? Um, I believe it was around one three, one zero three. Can you just pull that microphone a little closer and ask you, Mr. Barnell, also to project a little more? I need to project more. A little. More. I will. Uh, in regards to Michael Cates, do you recall what his blood serum level was? Uh, one three zero. And Jennifer Imhoff. Uh, I think that was three two zero. And under the law, is there also time limits, or is time also something that's a relative factor as to when the blood or, or the substance is collected, when it's analyzed, <coughs> the presence of alcohol? Um, I know the general rule for traffic stuff is they want to be done within two hours, but uh, that's really not my field of expertise. And to be clear, all these records that we're talking about were not done to determine someone was driving drunk, uh, was trying to apply the laws of, uh, of operating a vehicle on the pair, is that fair to say? Correct. That information is in those medical records, correct? It is. Let's move on then. Uh, in regards to witnesses, uh, you indicated that there were witnesses that were interviewed at the scene, <coughs> correct? Yes, everyone who was at the scene at the time the police arrived was interviewed. And in regards to this investigation, uh, can you state uh, how many witnesses in total, uh, lay witnesses, were interviewed in regards to, to this crime? Um, there were 45 initial witnesses, and then I believe there were three more um, subsequent witnesses located in, in February of, of this year that were also interviewed. So somewhere between 45 and 50 witnesses. And you know, testified a little bit before that there were some interviews going on there at the bar and then subsequent interviews. The interviews at the bar, were you involved in all those interviews? No, actually I wasn't involved in any of those interviews. I was directing the crime scene and trying to try to control things. Um, detectives Mara, um, Ross, Stewart, and Morrison conducted all the interviews at the bar. And you had an opportunity, though, to hear those interviews as being the supervisor involved in this case? I reviewed and eventually transcribed all of those interviews. And those interviews, uh, in general, what were the length of those interviews that occurred there in the bar that evening? Uh, short, between three and seven minutes, I would say. And the, do you recall the focus of the questioning of those interviews? Um, a synopsis of what happened or what they what they saw happened, if anything. Did those interviews involve exploring backgrounds and motives or things that may have happened earlier or days before? No. Now compare that then to uh, interviews that would have occurred at a later date. Well, at a later date, I've had time to go back to the police department, um, receive from Sergeant Wren all the angles of video, review the angles of video, um, go over the witness statements that I had and um, at that point you know you still have an incomplete picture of the incident. You have um, the videotape which tells a, a, a good portion of the story and then you have the witness statements that tell uh, 
another portion of the story, but there's still relationships and things going on that you can tell you're not aware of. So we tried to pick out the people from the video that were in the best position to um, see or hear the things that we wanted to know, and then we would call them back in for additional interviews. And where did those interviews occur? Uh, in the conference room on the sixth floor of the Akron Police Department. And in general, what was the average length of those interviews? Uh, 30 to 45 minutes. And did those all occur on one day or did they occur over a Oh, no, they were on uh, uh, separate days. And can you recall, as it relates to this case and the witnesses that the jurors have seen, which of those witnesses you were able to interview? Um, Mr. Bates was interviewed a second time at the police department. Mr. Eisel was interviewed a second time at the police department. Um, and a witness they haven't heard from, Mr. Ed Bachtel, was interviewed twice at the police department. Uh, um, Courtney Jewett uh, um, there were other witnesses. Tiffany I, Miller. Tiffany Miller was was also interviewed. I guess let me ask you easier. Every lay witness that's testified in this trial, were they interviewed at one time or another in this case? That's correct. Um, you mentioned that there were three additional individuals that were interviewed, I believe it's in February of 2015. That's correct. Can you tell us why these individuals were interviewed at such a later date? Uh, there were three females that were in the bar that left prior to the incident occurring. Um, after getting done with all the subsequent interviews, we had no idea who these three females were. No one in the bar could give us any information on how to contact them or who they were. Uh, eventually, um, I went again went to Sergeant Rain and asked him to put together some still shots from me, for me of those girls at the bar where their faces could clearly be seen, and we put those out to the public. And in short order, those girls called in, and then we were able to interview them. Those were also taped interviews, correct? Yes, sir. And all the interviews we've talked about, were those all recorded interviews, either uh, audio or audio and video? Everything that took place at the bar was audio interviewed. Everything that took place at the police station was both video and audio inter recorded. And to avoid any confusion, we heard from Jody Sugg and Natalie Lynn as two females that are sitting at the bar at Keenan Ivory. Those different That's correct. Now, are there a number of potential witnesses who do not provide any relevant information? Um, I would say half the half the bar um, had very limited or no useful information. Uh, there was a party for uh, some twins that were there that night, the Parfait twins, and they most of that party was outside. And we had some people out there that heard some pops, but the for, for the most part, that group was devoid of any information. What about witnesses that, in viewing the video, would appear to have had a, an opportunity, maybe a good opportunity, to hear and see certain things related to this case? Uh, there were witnesses, upon wa um, watching the video, we were very interested in interviewing. But when interviewed, to about your experience, uh, in dealing with violent cases, shootings, and homicides? Does that include uh, incidents either at a bar or that involve alcohol? I've had several of those cases, yes. Uh, and in regards to dealing with witnesses who may be alcohols involved or dramatic events such as a shooting, uh, have you had trouble in the past with witnesses who do not recall specific events? Uh, it's it's common. I would be worried if it didn't happen. If everybody, you know, remembered everything exactly, that that would be alarming. Does that include individuals who maybe didn't have much alcohol and still do not have recollection or did not see or hear events that you would hope they did? That's correct. After traumatic events, some some people just don't remember because of the 
you know, adrenaline levels and, and the level of fear that, that they're in, they just don't remember. Now, Jennifer Imhoff, she was uh, one of these individuals, is that correct? Yes. And you heard her testify, was she able to give you or your questioning any other detailed information about the events of that night? Uh, no, um, I, I believe due to her level of intoxication, that made it very difficult for her to remember specific events that went on. We heard on the 911 call, Officer Shields, um, did you have an opportunity to interview him? I did. And did he provide any information of details that he would have seen uh, that would have been relevant to this case? Um, no, and the, the video kind of matches that in the way that Officer Shields was seated at, the, seated at the bar and having his own conversations and really wasn't paying any attention to anything that was going on until shots were fired behind him. As far as you mentioned the name Ed Bactel, and um, why was he a person of interest? He was a person of interest because he was sitting directly next to Justin Weinbrenner when he, Justin Weinbrenner had an interaction with Keenan Ivory on the videotape. He was very, very close proximity, both him and Jeff Bates. So we were very interviewed and interview, interested in interviewing the both of them because we were very interested in what took place in that interaction. And did you speak with that back home? I did. And uh, how many times? Uh, well, he, was, he was interviewed by somebody else at the bar and then I interviewed him at the police station. Was he, to provide, was he able to provide any details of what was said or what was seen um, during the course of, of these events? He didn't provide any significant information. Did you view him on the video as far as whether he uh, was involved in drinking? Or? Uh, he, he, was, he was drinking. Um, in fact, after the shots are fired, he's seen ducking behind the bar and then reaching up and grabbing his beer and, and, and having a swig. Uh, during the incident. I'm sorry? During the incident. I believe he's there, and he's from the beginning of the videotape, he can be seen in that bar, I'm drinking throughout. Correct. <laughs> in regards to, we know from prior testimony that that the defendant's vehicle was left at the scene, is that correct? That's correct. Can you tell us what steps were taken in regards to, to that vehicle? Uh, that vehicle was towed to our police uh, vehicle processing garage. Uh, the tenant wouldn't cause that to happen. A search warrant was obtained for the vehicle, and the vehicle was searched. And what, if anything, of relevance is found in the vehicle? There were two phones found in the vehicle. Uh, one phone was operational. The other phone, uh, to my knowledge, hadn't even been turned on yet. Had not been activated. Activated. Um, anything else inside that vehicle uh, related to the events uh, that we're here for? No. Talking about phones, uh, through the course of the investigation, were there other phones that were obtained that were connected to, to Keenan Ivan? There were a total of four phones. There was the two from the vehicle that I've already mentioned. One that was found in his right front pants pocket at the time of his arrest, and one that was found underneath of him at the time of his arrest. And the phone that I believe was found ultimately in his pants pocket, uh, that was previously identified, but as to the phone that was found underneath him, let me show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 150. if you're able to identify that exhibit? I am. What do you identify that exhibit to be? Uh, this is a uh, black cellular phone that was found lying underneath Keenan Ivory. That was tagged by uh, Officer Michael Raddick. And Sergeant, as part of the investigation, how do you get uh, search warrants to be able to open the phones and, and view the contents within the phones? We do. Was that done for all four of those phones? Well, it was. And do you also, uh, are you able to determine the phone number of phones? Yes. And do you then, what do you do with that phone number? Um, we get a subpoena for the phone records um, from the company that, the, the service provider from the phone. And was that done in this case? It was. And those records were received? They were. 
as it pertains to the, the, the times in question, uh, Keenan Mark, Keenan Ivory, uh, removed from the Um, at 1.46 when he first leaves the bar, there's an incoming phone call. Uh, we used a program to triangulate that call um, at 1.46. It really doesn't tell us a whole lot because the bar, uh, his home, and a great deal of the Ellen area are in the area of possibility. So um, while it was done, it did provide very much help in the investigation. So, using phone records and the cell towers, the area that would be covered by the call included both uh, Keenan Ivory's home as well as Papa Dalla Hall, is that correct? That's correct. And it was at 146, so we'd obviously just left the bar, so, um, it, like I said, it wasn't of, of much investigatory help. As far as the other three folks, did they have anything from that time period when Keenan Ivory left the bar? Well, the, the, the phone, no, during that portion, no. What about uh, after the shooting? After the shooting, um, there were uh, several phone calls made to a uh, 234 number um, that was later identified to be the phone number of Kimberly Fisher, who is the living girlfriend and mother of Keenan Ivory's child. <laughs> These are calls made after the shooting, but prior to, to his arrest, correct? That's correct. And are, were they outgoing from the phone that was found laying under Keenan Ivory to this Kim Fisher? That's correct. And specifically, where did Keenan Ivory and Kim Fisher live? Uh, 233 Denison Avenue. And that's in Akron, correct? It's in Akron in the Ellen area, yes. And you know approximately how far it is that address from Papa Dot? Uh, according to Google Maps, it's about two miles. And did you take an opportunity to, to drive uh, that path to determine, uh, at least under your circumstances, how long that drive could have taken? Um, yeah, again, we looked at it on Google Maps. It had a four-minute drive time. I actually drove it myself, and de you know, depending on traffic conditions and lights, I know I caught the lights. So it took me five minutes and 34 seconds to drive from 233 Denison Avenue to Papa Don's Bar, obeying all traffic laws. As part of the investigation, did you uh, interview Kimberly Fisher as well? I did. Uh, and anybody else uh, in the household? Uh, yes, Keenan Ivory Jr. Ultimately, then, uh, the 40 caliber uh, fire gun was retrieved in this case, correct? It was. And uh, in your investigation, um, did you learn of uh, the <coughs> Ivory making references to the 40 caliber weapon uh, early on in the investigation? Um, yes. Uh, I learned that he mentioned having a 40 um, earlier in the night in conversation at the bar. And in even listening to that 911 call, it appears that there's mention of the 40 there. Based upon the timing, the gun would not have been retrieved yet. Is that, is that fair to say? The gun was being retrieved at about the time the 911 calls were being made. And when I mean retrieved, I mean actually being uh, Seized as evidence. Oh, well, no. It seized as evidence. No, it had not been at that point. It was learned that it was in the dumpster. Is that correct? Yes. Now, in your investigation, were you concerned or did you try to learn as to whether Keenan Ivory may have had the uh, 40 caliber gun in the bar prior to him being kicked out of the bar? Yes. And what kind of part of the investigation Revealed uh, helped you with that issue. The video, uh, specifically, watching his movements in the video, uh, when he has the objection, we approach.
Sergeant, let me ask you a couple questions before I repeat that question. In, in regards to your experience um, in investigating crimes as well as in the possession of firearms, do you become familiar with how individuals can carry a weapon? Um, not just through video, but just being a police officer uh, on the streets for eight years. Uh, you know, guns and waistbands are something that you come into contact on a fairly regular basis, and um, how they're dealt with, positioned, drawn, um, things of that sort. You are you are confronted with, you know, frequently. And carrying a concealed weapon is that that's a crime that uh, uh, police officers after police officers investigate on a daily basis, is that correct? That, yes, that's correct. And did you investigate those types of crimes as well? Yes, I have in my career. And once again, I ask you, as part of your investigation in this case, um, what did you see and learn regarding Keenan Ivory having uh, a firearm on his person prior to being kicked out? Um, when you watch the video at specific points, um, uh, there's a specific point where uh, he first is encountering Tiffany Miller um, uh, when the argument the, at the genesis of this first starts and she asks him to go to the end of the bar where he pulls his pants up and the, the waistband becomes visible and the, the, gun is, the gun is not visible at that point. Also, there's a point where he's at the jukebox for a uh, significant, significant amount of time um, with his right side directly facing the video camera and no love bulge or anything that would make me believe that there was a, a gun present is visible. Mr. Ivory was in the bar for approximately an hour and 20 minutes. Does that sound about accurate? Yes. In that video, did you have any witnesses who provided information that they saw a gun during that time period prior to him returning or saw that they believe it could be a gun in his, in, on his possession? The only evidence that we had that there was a gun is there was talk of a gun. No one saw a gun. Um, uh, no witnesses report seeing anything that they thought may be a gun or that they felt he had a gun. And although we've discussed witnesses maybe not having memories or recollections, you know, most or all the witnesses you talked to seem to want to provide as much helpful information as they could. That's correct. In regards to Tiffany Miller, uh, we interviewed her on November 25th, is that correct? That's correct. Did she provide any information as to the issue as to whether he, he being Keenan Ivory, had the gun prior to being kicked out? Uh, a key statement was made. Um, I'm not alone in okay. it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not alone anymore. Now, um, 
the defendant clearly came in the bar by himself. But that's also a clear indication or statement to me that the situation has changed in his mind. He's not alone anymore. And that was a statement that, that she indicated occurred after being kicked out of the King and Ivory returns. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, another issue that has been referred to um, in this trial is, is the chicken wings and the implication that King and Ivory may have returned to the bar for his chicken wings. Based on the investigation, did you have any witnesses uh, that provided information to support that possibility? No. Of the people that engaged Keen and Ivory when he returned to the bar, no one reported the mention of any chicken wings. Um, in fact, prior to him leaving the bar, we have a, a Gordon Jewett, who was a sober witness, one of three witnesses known to be sober, at the time not drinking that night, um, you make the quote that King didn't want the fucking wings. And did you put that quote specifically in your in your report in this case? I did. Did you put that in there at that time, focus on the wings? No, I didn't think the wings were gonna be an issue. I put it in there because of, uh, I thought it showed anger rather than, I had, I had no idea the wings were gonna come up. That quote was put in there specifically for, uh, to show that he was upset at the time. The uh, fucking wings being the, the important aspect of that statement. Correct. <coughs> As the lead investigator then, do you become involved in uh, making sure evidence is submitted uh, to BCI, learning about those results, uh, uh, and applying those to the entire case? I, I, I I have to say that uh, Lieutenant Dave Whitten, um, in meetings I had with him, uh, was uh, crucial to that part of the investigation. I was in another murder trial in this very courtroom as this investigation was going on, and so my days were pretty tied up. And uh, we, had, we would have discussions in the morning about what evidence that we would send up, and he, um, he, he sent literally all the evidence to BCI after we had this discussions about what we were going to send. And, uh, you know, I analyzed the results when they got back. Okay. And the results we heard in court, you the results uh, a ways back, right, and putting the pieces together in this case. That's correct. Um, and ultimately, how many of the bullets, uh, how many bullets were recovered in this case? Um, so the jury's clear. There's four shell casings and three bullets are actual projectiles. And the actual projectiles, how many of those were recovered in this case? Three. And tell us the type of testing and analysis uh, with those bullets and how it pertains to uh, what uh, we can learn in the investigation. Well, the bullets were tested for um, two things, DNA and what gun they were fired from. And the bullets were fired from the recovered gun, and the DNA found on the bullets kind of helps us, along with the video, figure out how each bullet, who each bullet had contacted prior to coming to final rest, wherever that was. And we know that a bullet, one bullet came to rest um, close to the south end uh, of the bar near where Dave Wilkady had fallen. Yes, that bullet. Um, struck Dave Wilkady uh, in the arm, went through his chest, out his back, into the arm of uh, Jennifer Emhoff. And if you watch the video and look at it, the next logical conclusion is it also went through the sweatshirt of uh, an officer and then ended up ricocheting down to that end of the bar. And you were aware of the DNA results as it pertains to that bullet? Yes. And that would be consistent with the DNA, or if DNA was found on there, which would be consistent with Dave Wilkady, as well as Ken Fredlock? Correct. And then there is another, you know, another uh, projectile that's recovered in the air duct, is that correct? That's correct. And uh, whose DNA was recovered on that? Officer Justin Lightbrenner. And then a third bullet was recovered um, 
on the outside door frame of the outside uh, of Papa Don. Is that correct? That's correct. Your DNA was found on that. Officer Justin Weinberger. Now, we did see on the video another bullet. We heard Michael Kidd's testimony. Um, did, in fact, your review of the investigation this scene, would that be consistent with the bullet being recovered by that individual in the video? Yes, Mr. Cage was hitting the, hitting the foot. There's also trash can bullet defects that are found in that area, and the bullets picked up off the floor and given to Mr. Cage. And, um, you know, it, we are safely assuming, I believe, that that is the bullet that in fact struck Mr. Cage in the foot. But that bullet was never uh, placed into evidence and, and sent to BCI. That is correct. The magazine uh, for the 40 caliber gun, was that ever located in the state? It was never located. There were several searches uh, done. Um, Tell us uh, about that, please. Well, that night there were searches done. The next day there were searches done. There were searches done later um, in the spring when all the snow had melted and the foliage hadn't grown up yet. Uh, Several attempts were made to find the magazine, it was just never located. Besides foliage, uh, what other type of uh, areas are located around Papadons as well as uh, in relation to where Keenan Ivory was ultimately arrested? Well, the jury's uh, both seen in the jury view and her testimony of a, a small canal that runs through there in a very rocky area. Um, you know, if the magazine were in there, it would be very difficult to find or recover. Ultimately, once again, we did not cover that magazine, correct? We did not. Uh, in regards to the weapon, uh, can you run a trace on a firearm? You can. Are there challenges or frustrations that occur on a regular basis when you try to trace a firearm? Uh, yes, there are. Tell us about that in general. Well, um, when someone buys a, a handgun at, at, at a store, um, that is traceable. <coughs> um, the, where you run into problems is you'll have gun shows where people go and they trade guns and there's no record kept of that. So you generate the system loses track of the gun and there's no way to know who had it or what the chain to follow after that, that trade or sale of the gun. And in this case then, did you run a gun trace? Uh, a gun trace was run by Detective Paul Braley at the request of Lieutenant Dave Wood. What if anything was learned from that? Uh, a gentleman uh, in Mentor had bought the, the gun in a gun store, um, uh, had it for a while, decided he didn't like it, took it to a gun show at the Southern County Fairgrounds where he traded it with another gun, and that's where the trail ends. And that would have been approximately what date? Uh, I want to say it was in February of 2014. Keenan Ivory's name never came up with that? No. In regards to your investigation, uh, besides the 40 caliber found in the dumpster, were there any other firearms found at the scene or around the scene? No. Uh, was there any evidence provided, uh, first of all, that Justin Weinbrenner uh, had any firearm being a, issued by the police department or any firearm or weapon on his person? No. Was there any evidence provided that they were caught in a firearm or any type of weapon on his person at the time of this incident? No. Is there any evidence uh, that you were in the David Isol, a weapon, a firearm, anything on his person at the time of this incident? No, sir. In regards to the video then, um, can you tell us what steps the actual police department took to try to enhance the audio and the visual uh, of those videos since they were a key piece of evidence in the case? Well, as we've talked about before, some witnesses can't remember hearing everything um, that night, and we wanted as much detail as we could possibly get. So Lieutenant Winden had knowledge of a group who could help us with that. Uh, the gentleman who testified yesterday um, from the Attorney General's Office uh, Organized Crime Division and we sent both the, the video off to be both 
um, digitally enhanced for photographic purposes and for audio purposes. In regard to the audio purposes, you then receive uh, the evidence that, uh, from the Attorney General's office regarding their work? Correct. And did that audio, uh, did you have an opportunity to listen to it when you, when you received it? Yes, I did. And did other officers be able to listen to it as well? Yes. And the enhancement, did that provide any additional ability to make out words or specific details of what was said uh, just prior to the shooting after Ken and I returned to the fall? We didn't find the audio particularly helpful. In regards to screens and things of those nature, were you able to say specifically who screened or who said what? Uh, yeah. Since last Monday when we started this, did you if review the tape to try to hear if you could hear bro, bro, bro? Yes. And can you make out certainty that Keen and I would say bro, bro, bro? Objection. Say what? We'll also stay in that. Just ask the open-ended question. In regards to specific statements, screens, words, uh, through your investigation, were you able to tie in anything specifically said on that video to this case and to a video? No. I'm going to show you now what's been marked as State's Exhibit 133. Um, this is the Ohio Organized Crime Investigations video, um, uh, one of one, uh, clarified photos, PDF images, sequences. And did you have an opportunity to view those images? Uh, I don't remember the exact number, but there could have been three or four hundred as to each minute of video. Uh, that we presented for the jury yesterday. Yes. And this was provided back, or dated back in December of 2014. Did you have a chance to do that? Correct. Right. Did, did you also have an opportunity to view the video itself, slow it down, and, and try to view it to the best of your abilities? Correct. I'm going to ask you some questions then in regards to these slides. Can we approach before he does that? Yep.
me know for me to generalize. I will, Your Honor. First of all, Sergeant Lindy, as it pertains to the uh, camera 13, uh, first part that was uh, testified to yesterday, as far as sending that to the Attorney General, were there specific areas of that portion uh, that you had interest in, in, in enhancing the picture as much as possible? Yes, the defendant's movements while inside the vehicle and the defendant's movements uh, as soon as he exited the vehicle were of particular interest. Is that something, as a, even as a patrol officer, uh, that, that you're trained and uh, taught to, to be concerned with as an individual, potentially suspect's movements within a vehicle? Correct. And also the suspect's movements as it pertains to a potential weapon that they may possess. Correct. I'm going to ask then that uh, Sergeant Lipke approach the screen and in regards to the movements that she felt uh, to view. Thank you. Judge, if you would uh, put the lights on. Correct? 
That's correct. On the slide 380. Uh, Officer Weidner is pushing Keenan Ivory out the door 
and uh, over here, I just hold up the table. Based upon your investigation, watching the video, listening to it, believe that was the first shot? Yes, sir. Jeffrey Eisel here, slide 498. He is falling right here by the door. It would be his left side is, is closest to the door. Right. You said Jeffrey Eisel? David Eisel. Excuse me, David Eisel. Okay, just checking. All right, I apologize. He, his left side is closest to the door? That's correct. And, uh, and the bullet holes that we've seen in his jacket, would that be consistent with going from left to right through his jacket in that position? That's correct. Capes react to the bullet in his foot. And he's looking down at that point? That's correct. Okay. All right, you can resume your seat. I'm going to hand you what's been marked as States Exhibit 150 and ask you if you're able to identify that exhibit. I am. 
And what do you identify that exhibit to be? It's a timeline of uh, key moments created to go along and explain the video. And you were involved uh, in helping to, to make somewhat of a just very basic timeline uh, of events that occur based upon the timestamp in the video? That's correct. Okay. I'm going to put that on the document. <laughs> seconds, Justin Weinbrenner and Tiffany Miller arrive. <coughs> At 1.30 and 10 seconds, Anne-Marie Cusio walks to the south end of the bar. At 1.34 and 48 seconds, Anne-Marie Cusio walks behind the bar. At 1.35 and 16 seconds, Keenan Ivory approaches Tiffany Miller and Anne-Marie Cusio at the table. At 1.36 and 17 seconds, Keenan Ivory and Tiffany Miller walk to the south end and continue talking. At 1.37.55, Justin Weinbrenner walks to the south end to check on Tiffany Miller and Keenan Ivory. At 1.39.24, Keenan Ivory and Tiffany Miller, Miller's conversation continues at the bar. At 1.43.22, Keenan Ivory and Tiffany Miller's conversation ends. At 1.44 and 42 seconds, Keenan Ivory and Justin Winter, Weinbrenner interact at the bar. <coughs> at 1.45 and 15 seconds, Keenan Ivory exits the bar. At 1.52 and 20 seconds, Keenan Ivory pulls into the parking lot. At exactly 1.53 and 0 seconds, Keenan returns to the bar. At 1.53 and 56 seconds, shots are fired. And now hand you what's been marked for, the, for identification purposes as State's Exhibit 151. Ask if you're able to identify that exhibit. And this is a still shot from camera four with a timestamp of 153.12. And at 153.12, um, what can Keenan Ivory, as far as his body position, be seen doing? He's lifted his jacket and placed his hand uh, on a firearm. And based upon your investigation, how long had he been in the bar at that uh, point? Twelve seconds. And as far as this slide, it, it comes from the Attorney General based on the timestamp? Correct. And the difference, the timestamp when it's in the middle, kind of smaller, that's directly from the video. And when it's shown uh, in larger numbers off to the side, that's from the Attorney General's uh, enhancement? You're correct, sir. And it states Exhibit 152. Uh, this is another still shot from camera four with a timestamp of 1.53 and 21 seconds. Um, again, uh, Keenan Ivory is in a position where he's lifting up the right side of his jacket and uh, um, accessing uh, the, the firearm. And this is a printed out version of, of the slide date, date stamped at one. 5321, is that correct? That's correct. 
I don't recall if I asked you in regards to State's Exhibit 151, is that uh, a true and accurate image uh, from the Attorney General's slides, timestamp 153.12? Yes, sir, it is. Now, we previously went over the slides in regards to camera four and what you described as uh, being consistent with the first shot being fired. At this time, I'll hand you printed out slides. Mark State's Exhibit 153 through 150. Uh, 153 is at 153 and 55 seconds. The right. shot. I'm sorry, you can look at the whole group uh, and then describe what we're looking at rather than each one. <laughs> And what are those group of slides? Uh, this is a group of slides from camera four that shows David Bocchetti reacting as if he is hit by the first shot fired in the video. Okay. And those are the same slides that we went over on the screen but printed out? They are. And those truly and accurately depict the slides that were developed by the Attorney General's office? They do. And then in regards to camera three, I'll hand you as a group and have you look at them as a group. States Exhibit 160, 161, 162, 163, 164, 165, and 166. Can you identify those group of exhibits? Um, this is from camera three. Uh, this is the, shows Dave Locati reacting to the first shot. Dave Isel falling under a table and Justin Weinbrenner um, continuing out the front door of the bar. And all these slides then states exhibit 160 through 166. They truly and accurately depict the slides we went through for camera three that were developed by the Attorney General's office? Yes, sir, they did. Exhibit first of all 168. I recognize this um, as a still shot from camera camera number four. The difference in this uh, still shot is it, there is a blue arrow um, pointing to Justin Weinbrenner and a white arrow pointing to Keenan Ivory, and their names are on the bottom. With the, in the corresponding colors, so the arrows are pointing them out. Okay. And then, and, and this is a still from the original video as opposed to the Attorney General's enhancement, is that Yes, correct? this appears to be from the original video. And then finally, 169. 169 
is a still from camera three of the original video, time stamped at 153.55, but it has arrows, colored arrows above the heads of Keenan Ivory, Justin Weinbrenner, David Eisel, David Wilkady, Jennifer, Jennifer Imhoff, Thomas Russell, and Michael Capes. Um, it points out each individual person. And the timestamp on this and the photo, excuse me, the still, is that the same still that you previously identified as being at or near the time of the first shot? That's correct. Okay. For the benefit of the jury, I'll put you two exhibits on the screen. First of all, states exhibit 168. Want me to dim the lights? Should that be very good? And he indicates that there's been identifiers added to this photograph. Is that correct? Yes, sir. The identifier being Keenan Ivory, uh, in light with a light arrow, Justin Weinbrenner, excuse me, Justin Weinbrenner, and blue with a blue arrow. Correct. And uh, based upon your investigation, what was occurring at this time? Um, there was an interaction between the uh, two of them at the bar. And then lastly, it states that 169. You indicated was at or near the time of the first shot of the investigation. Can't do much about the letter. And this again uh, identifies Keen uh, Ivory, Justin Weinbrenner, David Eisel, David Bulkady, Jennifer Inhoff, Thomas Russell, Michael Cates with arrows as to their exact position at the time, at or very close in time to the very first shot. Is that, uh, is that true? That's correct. several detectives, um, depending on scheduling for victims or witnesses, collected uh, the DNA standards. It wasn't just done by me. What is a DNA standard? Uh, you take a cotton swab um, and you insert it in a person's mouth and you swab each side of the mouth with a separate swab. You put it in a white container um, in a box, uh, label it, and then uh, send it to BCI as a known standard DNA. And finally, uh, there were numerous uh, swabs of blood stains from outside and inside, uh, particularly inside the bar. Um, what determination were made with those as to whether they needed to be de tested to determine whose blood they were? Well, it was clear that the blood outside the bar belonged to Justin Weinbrenner. And it was clear that most of the blood inside the bar was either going to belong to David Lucchetti or Jennifer Imhoff or Michael Caves, depending on the position of the blood. The blood we weren't so sure about was the blood right at the front door. Um, it could have been Justin Weinbrenner's or David Lucchetti's, depending on you know how the shots went. We didn't know. So that was where we sent the blood off to be tested because that's, that's where we most wanted to know whose blood was whose, that's where the confusion was. And those positions in the front uh, entrance of the, the bar came back as
things. We're going to take our break now for cross-examination, so that will be a lunch break of an hour. I'll remind you not to discuss this case amongst yourselves or with you or any presence. Don't investigate this case in any fashion. Don't talk to anyone involved in this case. And um, be back at 1.30 in the jury room. Just stay in there right now. So, All right.